LMS and take a course, or they are one of those highly self-actuated alpha people who want to go in and develop their own careers. Um, but for them, it's, it's a course they want to take it. Um, once they've launched it in the LMS, that's when the magic happens. So from a learner's perspective, it's completely transparent. They realize that something's different is happening and it's respecting their needs and it's asking them questions and things. But the overall flow of how do I find the course? How do I get into the course? How do I take the course? It's identical. So it's we've tried to make it, we've tried to be able to deliver the benefits that all of this learning science can give but recognize that it has to exist in a in an ecosystem that people don't want to rip and replace. You have a pretty amazing board of directors. There's some there's some kind of rock stars uh, there, and and um, some pretty staggering VC investments in terms of dollars as well. Um, <laughs> and I think because people are this is you know helping people be more effective learners and and teaching people effectively at scale is something of a holy grail and skills are just so top of mind in everywhere at the moment. Um, you know, this idea of making learning more efficient. Do you, do you, does your, does the team feel like you're, you're making an impact to the other high expectations? And then maybe you could talk a little bit about um, this, this split between an academic focus and a corporate focus. What, what if anything's been learned from that? Yeah. Okay. So there's a there's a lot wrapped up in there. So yes, we do have what we believe is is the best advisory board in the industry, and that goes back to the core of the company, which is really all about the underlying academic research. There's there's plenty of companies that have been started by you know, someone from MIT or someone coming out of university with a clever idea. Um, what we've tried to do is look. At, this is a multivariate problem, and we've tried to bring together. A range of people who literally are world experts in their field. So, you know, anybody that has read um, some of Malcolm Gladwell's work will know the the ten thousand hour rule about becoming an expert. Mm -hmm. And although that wasn't quite portrayed the, the way the underlying research um, was written, that is based on the the work of Anders Ericsson. Um, and Anders is the godfather of deliberate practice. Uh, Anders is on our advisory board, and we built his work into the platform. Um, Angela Duckworth, with her work on grit and perseverance, is on our board. We built her work into the platform. Uh, Todd Rose, who wrote um, The End of Average, which anybody in the L&D space, if you haven't read The End of Average, I would strongly recommend you do that. It was, it was a big wake up for me. Um, Todd is on our board, and, and we've incorporated a lot of his ideas into the platform. So it, it's part of that ongoing theme of um, there's a lot of buzzwords in the L&D space. We are not a buzzword company. If, if we cannot back it up by peer-reviewed scientific research, it doesn't make it into the platform because we're, we're really trying to transform the industry. Um, there are some venture capitalists out there who believe that you know the industry today is or the the global economy today is dominated by you know the amazons of the world the sales forces of the world these huge corporations there are some who believe the largest software company in the world in 20 years is going to be an education company and we have sights on that so we are in this for the long haul um with a very strategic view of the dire need that we believe exists out there, both in industry and in education, which is why we've really only got one major investor beyond the original founders of the company, um, and that is the Danish Government Innovation Fund. And they made the largest investment in any company they've ever made in when they did the investment in Area 9. And that was really a, a multi-decade view Um, yeah, let's let's um, now we fix our internet problems. Uh, hopefully, um, let's talk a little bit about um, about the future. What what, what do you think is um, the future for corporate learning? Are you optimistic about the future? And what's next for 
area nine in terms of deploying your technology and evolving it? The decision I made four years ago to come over to area nine, I think speaks a lot to where my head is, which is I, I think the future is personalized. Um, we've done, I think, uh, we've done as much as we could do with the technology we had at the time with the original e-learning and various other things clearly is you know, we need to deliver learning at scale and that's not going to change. But what we need to do is to better serve the needs of individuals and not just sheep dip everybody mm -hmm. and not think that giving someone access to 10,000 courses is magically going to solve their development needs. So um, I think we've started down that journey. The ability to deliver instruction in a personalized way in the moment, I would argue is largely a solved problem now. We know what works. The learning science is solid. We've been able to instantiate that in technology. We've proved it out for literally millions of learners in every industry, in every you know, walk of life from university to sixth grade through you know, 70 year old doctors who are you know, being board certified again. Um, so that I think is a solved problem. Um, I think there's a lot of work still to do in how you decide at a macro level what people should be studying. How do you, you know, when someone is performing on the job, if you're a doctor or a salesperson or whatever, I, I would argue we don't have very good diagnostic tools yet to figure out if you've got a finite amount of time to spend getting better at something, what is the best thing for you to do? That is a horrendously complex question that is incredibly contextual, but maybe AI can at least bring something to bear in that space. And I know there are a number of companies that are, are trying to do things now, and it's certainly one of the areas that we're looking at. Um, we don't do augmented reality or virtual reality. What we have found is that the vast majority of learning problems don't need that. Um, you can get the efficacy you need much more simply than having to start create 3D worlds. Um, but clearly there are some problems that massively benefit from that. Mm. And the intersection of personalization with AR and VR should be one of the holy grails you know mm -hmm. one of the problems with ar and vr is it's another of these technologies that people are getting very enamored with but you can waste as much of someone's time giving them the wrong vr course as you can giving the wrong e-learning course or making them sit in a classroom for a week when they don't really need to be there yeah conceptually the same the same problem statement absolutely there. it's a it's set of tasks a, and activities it's a different modality yeah. absolutely but the the benefit of of AR and VR is you do get that affective and immersive component because mm. there, there's absolutely, you know, one of the, again, one of the unsolved problems is motivation, right? It's how do you get, how much time have we all spent as managers chasing people to complete their compliance training or whatever it happens to be. Um, and it is the case that you can, take it all to water and all the rest of it but there ought to be some things that we can do to help learners become better you know it, it's the problem that medicine faces you know when we go to the doctor when we've got a problem we don't always like what they tell us in terms of you need to exercise more or you need to change your diet um, some of the things we just need to suck it up and do it so there's, I think there's a big L&D question around motivation and how we help everybody achieve their maximum potential. Um, John Hattie, an Australian researcher, again, one of those things that I came across a few years ago is fascinating reading, did a, a big meta study of what are the things that affect childhood development. And one of the absolute biggest things that you can do for any child to help them succeed is set high expectations. There is a, a universal truth that I've come to believe in, which is that people will generally live up to the expectations that you set. And if you, and it's clear from the research with children that if you, clearly not everybody is capable of everything, but if you set the expectation that you can achieve this, most kids are capable of doing that if you give them the right help. 
if you tell a kid that they're a D student, by God, they're going to be a D student. Yeah. Um, and the same is true in the corporate space. If, if we give people the opportunity and the support they need to be successful and technology provides us an avenue to do that at scale, then I think we can get a lot further forward than we are today as an industry. We were on a panel together recently and we had about two minutes each. I mean, I think that it was, <laughs> yes. um, uh, I must get Solve the world nice problems example. in two minutes. Um, one, one thing that in pr prepping for it that, that uh, I was thinking about was, you know, the trends in productivity software is trends about collaboration and in, interaction, like Teams from Microsoft and Slack and um, uh, a lot of agile developments. You know, work is becoming an increasingly a team sport. And um, I was thinking, in a way, it's a little bit contrary to the sort of high this sort of personalization and the sort of isolation of e-learning and the, the sort of study models that we had, uh, you know, around asynchronous self-study. Do you think there's ways that we could apply the technology to cohort learning programs? Have you been thinking about that at all? Yes, we have thought about that. Um, and you're right. We are, we've been very focused on individual development. Um, and again, it's, it's a multivariate problem. One of the things that we've already done is the ability to inject the human into the loop. Um, and as you say, particularly for cohort programs, we've recognized that it doesn't make sense to computer score everything. Mm. Um, so one of the ways is simply to allow individuals to self-score so provide them with you know a rubric and, and again from a reflection perspective how well you did how well do you think you did compared with maybe what an ideal answer might have been um, but then encourage peer-to-peer -peer yeah back um, so i do something you grade me we both learn from the process yeah um, or introducing you know a facilitator into that yeah, it's interesting that, that you made me think a little bit about, you know, there's one way to solve the scale problem in the in the two sigma problem is to get machines to do the teaching. The the other way is to get machines to make more coaches and tutors and sort of enable people to be better at coaching and tutoring as well. That might be another way to go at it. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's going to be different strokes for different folks. Different companies have, have, have approached it different ways. I know a company in Silicon Valley um, that has something like 200 trained coaches. There's a, a big oil field engineering company that has something like 3,000 trained assessors. Right. Uh, so that there, there are always different ways to solve these problems. Um, but as you say, if, if, you, if you keep in mind the goal of, you know, it's not exactly socialism, but it's, everybody should be given an appropriate opportunity. You know, it's great that the CEO gets a personal coach. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we gave everybody in the company the, the best opportunity they could be to be successful. And generally the only way you're going to accomplish that is by, by leveraging, techno leveraging technology, whether, as you say, whether it's enabling other people to do their jobs better, to provide help, coaching, support, facilitation, feedback, removing the friction from that process or whether it is individualized you know it, it's going to vary from situation to situation got it nick i ask everyone who comes on the podcast why they chose to work in this line of work it's sometimes thankless and um <laughs> not always a way to get rich um uh, but there's something special about helping people learn what what inspired you um to get into this line of work as with many people, I, I fell into it by accident. Um, it, it's something I found appealing. I owned our customer education training as part of owning our services business uh -huh. um, back in the day. And I found I enjoyed the education thing more than the rest of it. And fundamentally, it was the ability to make a difference. You know, education in any company is one of the few professions that touches every part of the value chain. You definitely touch every employee, 
But in a more complex organization, and you know this from your time at Microsoft, you've got resellers, you've got customers. Education touches everything more than any other bit of the business does. And it's 